Hello and welcome to the Nexus once again. Today we're looking at a leader who was once compared to Nelson Mandela and Gandhi, but is now all too often cast as a villain. Myanmar's Aung San Suu Kyi. Well, now she admits the Rohingya situation could have been, quote, handled better. An incredible understatement when the United Nations suspects genocide. She's also defending the jailing of two Reuters journalists and challenges anyone to find something wrong with their conviction. All the while, more and more people are calling for her to be stripped of the Nobel Peace Prize. Would that be fair? We'll take a look at the evidence right now on The Nexus. Hello, I'm Matthew Moore, and today in The Nexus, she was a pro-democracy hero when in opposition, but since becoming Myanmar's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi has suffered a rapid fall from grace. Has one of history's good guys gone bad? Well, we're going to be asking our panel in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at this recap of the evidence. Aung San Suu Kyi has been released. They've been waiting for seven years to see her. They are running through the centre of Rangoon. Suu Kyi spent 15 of the past 21 years in detention. We hope that this will be the beginning of a new era. She heads a massively popular political party opposing Myanmar's military dictatorship. Aung San Suu Kyi is arguably one of the most loved people in Myanmar. Suu Kyi's unwavering position won her a Nobel Peace Prize. Her father, Aung San, was among the most pivotal figures in the history of modern Burma. He negotiated the terms of his country's independence from the British. A lot of people have compared her with Nelson Mandela, but there's one crucial difference. Aung San Suu Kyi cannot be president. Because the military has made damn sure that Burma democracy will remain on a very short leash. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims from Myanmar have been forced to flee. At least 392 villages have been destroyed and thousands killed. Some 700,000 Rohingya fled. The UN has called it ethnic cleansing. The UN also stresses cases of women being gang raped and children assaulted. United Nations investigators are accusing Myanmar's top military leaders of genocide. Aung San Suu Kyi is facing serious international criticism. There are many allegations and counter allegations. I have not gone into any of them because it is not my pur purpose to promote and encourage conflict. I don't think it has come through to her the full extent, uh, the horror uh, of what has happened, the sheer devastation. I've, ne I've seen nothing like it in my life. Aung San Suu Kyi has been a little bit like an ostrich with her head in the sand. We are deeply disappointed that State Councillor Dao Aung San Suu Kyi has not used her position or her moral authority to stem, prevent or condemn the unfolding events in Rakhine State. Uh, we've been very vocal in our criticism of Aung San Suu Kyi, but we shouldn't get confused in terms of who can actually really move the needle on this issue inside Myanmar, and that is directly with the army. This is a scorched earth, you know, burn it and shoot it army. And, you know, they have once again committed ethnic cleansing. The mission has concluded that criminal investigation and prosecution is warranted, focusing on the top Tatmadaw generals, in relation to the three categories of crimes under international law. Genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Well, let's go to our panel now. We're very lucky to have with us Matthew Smith. He is with a human rights organisation uh, based in Thailand. He's been going to Myanmar for years. In fact, uh, Matthew, we have pictures of you showing around journalists around Myanmar. I need to start with you and ask you, do you agree, from what you've seen over the years, uh, that the military in Myanmar is actually trying to wipe out the Rohingya? Absolutely. Uh, the evidence that we've collected over the last several years, particularly in 2016 and 2017, points to the crime of genocide. Uh, and, uh, you know, further to the recent UN report, uh, Fortify Rights and other human rights organizations, including Rohingya civil society groups, have been calling for a referral to the International Criminal Court. 
Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. I just want to play a soundbite from Aung San Suu Kyi. She's just been justifying her position on the Rohingya. Let's have a listen. It's the World Economic Forum. Let's have a listen. There, there, there are, of course, ways in which we, with hindsight, might think that the situation could have been handled better. But we believe that for the sake of long-term stability and security, we have to be fair to all sides. The rule of law must apply to every, everybody. Matthew, just to be clear, Aung San Suu Kyi is not accused of genocide by the United Nations. It's the generals. But when you hear her there justifying it and saying we need to be fair to all sides, do you think she should be on the hook for it? Well, I think firstly, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is morally bankrupt right now. Her leadership has been appalling on this issue. Um, and there's no evidence at present, uh, certainly not that we've collected, that demonstrates that she's had command and control over the soldiers who have been perpetrating the crime of genocide. That doesn't necessarily exonerate her, and it doesn't necessarily mean that evidence uh, of that nature might not emerge in the future. But right now, um, you know, the mark of, a, of an effective and good leader in Myanmar is not necessarily whether or not they can be convicted of genocide or not. Mm -hmm. um, she's really proven to be uh, a disaster on this and other ethnic issues in the country. We're actually showing uh, pictures here of the head of the army and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. I just want to show some pictures of some internment camps in the Rakhine state, which I know you have visited many, many times. Uh, over the years. Can you tell us what conditions are like there and what you saw there? Well, you know, there, there are dozens of internment camps uh, that uh, the government is confining more than 125,000 Rohingya to these camps. They're located in eight townships throughout Rakhine State. These are modern day concentration camps. I think the, the images that, uh, that are appearing here are actually new camps that have been constructed in northern Rakhine State. But there are right now more than 125,000 people. Um, they're being deprived of adequate humanitarian aid. There are shelter needs, um, you know, the, the medical care, education, you name it. Uh, there are very serious humanitarian needs there. Matthew, you mentioned that the ICC has now decided it can investigate what's happening with the Rohingya. And we're lucky enough to have a Tun Kin. Tun Kin is a member of the Rohingya community. He's now living in London, uh, but he's currently at The Hague to discuss uh, with some prosecutors there the situation. Uh, can you tell us why the ICC's decision that it can investigate is a significant one? There are serious atrocity, you know, crimes against Rohingya happened. So uh, currently they are in Bangladesh, you know. So Bangladesh is a signatory, you know, but, at ICC. So ah. I hope that uh, that will that will be very uh, a big uh, a big support solidarity for the rohingya because when i met a big teams in the refugee camp the first thing they told me they want justice they want justice that three words i heard from them because these perpetrators this military uh, we must bring them to the international criminal court that is very important what is the rohingya view of Aung San Suu Kyi. Many Rohingya have been arrested for uh, supporting, uh, supporting to Aung San Suu Kyi, you know. Many Rohingya have been killed and tortured in jail because supporting Aung San Suu Kyi in the last 30 years. But today she is taking side of the military. She is denying all the atrocities. UN a fact-finding mission mentioned what's happened to Rohingyas is genocide. She is saying it's not happened. So she is complicit in this genocide. When was the point where you lost faith in Aung San Suu Kyi and knew and felt that you'd been betrayed? In 2012, after, you know, um, a state organized ethnic cleansing happened in Situe and other parts of Arkan, she said this is a conflict and she is totally, she have no will to protect the Rohingya. She failed to protect. We have seen also not this side in 2015. She did not take any Muslim, uh, uh, you know, ro Muslim been playing a key role in Burmese politics for uh, since independence. She did not pick up any, uh, you know, any Muslim member uh, candidate uh, on her parties. Well, let's go to Justin Wintel now, our third guest. He wrote a biography about Aung San Suu Kyi and was at Oxford University uh, at the same time 
as that uh, as Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, you said that she's essentially acting like her father, the general who is the founder of modern-day Myanmar. Uh, her father was assassinated when she was only two years old, so she never really knew him at all, but she was brought up by um, uh, the general's wife, um, uh, who, who really um, inculcated the same values that uh, General Aung San had. He never had any time for the Muslims at all when he was creating the Union uh, after the war. Uh, though he, he didn't recognize that there was really a Muslim constituency within, within the country. So it shocks me, mm. but it doesn't really surprise me um, that she's gone in the direction that she has gone. That said, I never thought that I would ever say that she has blood on her hands, but she, in my opinion, has blood on her hands now. Um, but she's Queen Bee. She's still mm. adored by the ethnic Burman people, and I don't think she wanted to give her that. I think the military said to her, and this is my gut feeling, is uh, you play along with us, sweetheart, uh, or we're going to suspend the parliament and you'll be out of a job. Let's go to each of our panellists now and ask them if they think that Aung San Suu Kyi should be stripped of her Nobel Peace Prize. Matthew, if I could come to you, would you support that? At this point, I think the most important thing is really not about stripping her of medals or, or honours. Mm. It's really about ensuring a change in behavior in the Myanmar authorities mm -hmm. and holding perpetrators accountable. Tunkin, same question to you. We also support that, but I don't know how things can happen because Nobel Committee already mentioned it, it will, uh, they are not considering about it. Justin, uh, do you think that is something that is necessary, uh, uh, one form of sanction, if you like, to put more pressure on Aung San Suu Kyi? Well, it'd embarrass her. Um, I, I, it's not. Uh, it'd be a kind of tokenism. I, I mean, she's always been unique, and she would become unique again by having uh, the tag uh, X Nobel mm. Peace Prize winner on her CV. Um, they can't get the money back, and all that's been actually spent on, on good causes. So it's kind of tokenism, yeah. but it wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, Justin, thank you. Well, the United Nations says one of the biggest players in this alleged genocide is a social media company based in California. That's right, Facebook. Buddhist extremists in Myanmar use the site to spread fake and hateful stories about the Rohingya, which stirs up more and more violence. Pardon. Cats playing, dogs surfing and generally just showing off. Typical Facebook post, and that's probably true in Myanmar too. But for some Buddhist extremists, Facebook is their greatest tool to spread their hate of the Rohingya people. Last month, Reuters published a special report into how Facebook is used there, after finding on the site more than a thousand examples of posts and comments attacking the Rohingya and other Muslims. Most of these threatening comments were posted in the main local language, Burmese, and many have lingered on the site for years, despite Facebook's promise to take them down. On top of the hate speech, there's also fake news to worry about. Fake news, fake news, fake news. Like the story of the Muslim tea shop owner who raped a Buddhist employee. This false allegation exploded on Facebook and caused a deadly riot. Like many before her, the UN's Myanmar investigator warned about hate speech and fake news in Myanmar in March, saying Facebook had turned into a beast. The following month, Facebook's CEO had to explain why his company was doing hardly anything to stop the hate. We're hiring dozens of more Burmese language um, content reviewers. We're working with civil society in Myanmar to identify specific hate figures. We're standing up a product team to do specific product changes in Myanmar. But even now, Facebook has only about 60 people monitoring Myanmar. 60 people monitoring 18 million users, close to half of all adults in Myanmar being informed and misinformed via Facebook. But change is coming, albeit slowly. Last month, after the UN accused Myanmar's military of genocide, Facebook banned Myanmar's commander-in-chief, essentially cutting off the military's main channel of publication. 
Myanmar's critics say it's a step in the right direction, but not enough to stem the flow of hate. And at the same time, the traditional purveyors of news are finding it harder and harder to work in Myanmar. For example, two Reuters reporters who had been investigating a massacre were recently jailed for seven years for apparently breaching the Official Secrets Act. The case has been held in open court and all the hearings have been open to everybody who wished to go and attend them. And if anybody feels that there has been a miscarriage of justice, I would like them to point it out. All this while Aung San Suu Kyi is in charge, at least on the face of it. But then again, she was named the biggest backslider on Press Freedom 2018. Not exactly a title that sits well with Nobel laureate. And Aung San Suu Kyi has just been justifying the jailing of those two Reuters journalists at the World Economic Forum. Let's have a listen in again. The case has been held in open court and all the hearings have been open to everybody who wished to go and attend them. And if anybody feels that there has been a miscarriage of justice, I would like them to point it out. Well, let's go back to Matthew Smith. He knows all about this. Uh, Matthew, her justification there is that they were convicted of breaching the Official Secrets Act, not of investigating a massacre. What do you make of that? It's preposterous, Matthew. It, it really is. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi should know, uh, and I believe she does know, uh, that the merits of this case uh, simply don't exist. This, these, are, these are two journalists who, at, at great personal risk, mm. were documenting mm. the truth of what essentially amounts to genocide. And they were set up. Uh, these are trumped up charges. And they did not receive a fair trial. Um, the process has been flawed from the very beginning. Uh, broadly, Matthew, ha has press freedom got significantly worse under Suu Kyi? It has. Uh, journalists face great risks in, in doing their work in the country, uh, both national and international journalists. Mm. Uh, you know, they face threats um, and, and, other, and other obstacles to doing their work. And this is, of course, a pillar of any rights-respecting society, of any democracy. So the fact that it is backsliding tremendously is, is of enormous concern, to say the least. Uh, we know that Facebook has taken some incremental moves to improve the situation. For example, they've actually banned the top general from using uh, Facebook. Has Facebook done enough to stop the hatred being spread on their site? I think Facebook is trying to play catch up now. Mm. Unfortunately, uh, you know, this is a multi-billion dollar company that really didn't devote uh, any meaningful resources to uh, preventing the spread of hate speech and incitement mm. and, and other other nefarious activity on their platform. Uh, so I think right now Facebook deserves every bit of negative criticism right. that it's getting with regard to Myanmar. Okay, I want to talk about another figure in uh, Myanmar now, Ashin Warathu. We have a, a picture of the, the monk here. Um, uh, Tunkin, if I could come to you, Ashin Warathu had a big following on Facebook and uh, on social media, in other social media platforms. Can you tell us a bit about why this man is so important and what he does on social media that's so damaging? Uh, this is the man, you know, who instigated anti-Rohingya campaign, anti-Rohingya Muslims in 2012 onwards. You know, USDP government and uh, former military used him to attack against Rohingya, you know, in 2012 onwards. Uh, so, uh, you know, in Maitila, where uh, many Muslims been killed mm. by, you know, um, some extremists. That is what, uh, you know, Buddhi uh, some Buddhist talks. That's uh, what instigated by these uh, Wiratu and others. Well, let's just get into uh, the background against, uh, of Muslim. all this hatred that's being peddled in social media now. We have a little graphic to explain a bit about that. If you look at Myanmar's ethnic makeup, we have 135 ethnic group. The Buma are by far the largest, 68%, uh, where most of the ruling elite are drawn from. Uh, noticeably missing on that list is the Rohingya. That group was taken off in around 1982. Now, the government uh, says that group are Bengali terrorists, and it also accuses them of a range of offences, including one of those, uh, the violent attacks on police in Rakhine in August last year, carried out by the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Um, Tunkin, if I could come back to you, you know, some of these things, as we've heard, are fake news, hate speech made up. But that attack in August last year uh, by the, the small militia that we've just mentioned, 
That was a real attack, wasn't it? Yes, some desperate individuals been taken, some desperate actions we have seen because uh, Rohingya have been living in an open prison for many years. As you know, this genocide going on after 1978, you know, mm. denial of existence, denial of our identity, a restriction of movement, restriction on marriage, restriction on education, and creating popular violence and burning down their houses and pushing them to the camps. So these are such a consequently, systematically, they are doing genocide. They are destroying a Rohingya community with intent. It's a genocide. So some desperate individual, they attacking this military. I think, you know, you, uh, this is what's happened because of this long time persecution. Uh, Justin, I think uh, when we're describing the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, that's a rather grandiose term for a rather small, poorly armed militia. And I think you were, you were saying you know, before the show that it, it was almost they were pushed so hard so as to create a pretext for a massive backlash by the, the Myanmar military. Is that correct? Well, I think it is. Uh, for several years, uh, people like me have been saying that uh, the persecution of the Rohingya was going to create a backlash. And I think they, they wanted the backlash. Uh, the army wanted the backlash to give themselves the excuse to move in really mm. hard and do all the frightful things that they've done. And quite honestly, these attacks on the police stations, nasty as they were, um, were nothing compared to, to the kind of jihadist activities we've seen elsewhere in the world. Mm, thank you, Justin. Well, driving out the Rohingya from Rakhine State frees up land for others to use and make money from. Here are a few reasons why the area has such potential. Rakhine State's coastline is highly prized. Stretching along the Indian Ocean, it's a great trade route, not just for Myanmar, but also its two giant neighbours, China and India. Let's start with China, a huge oil importer, of course. As part of its One Belt, One Road initiative, China has built a pipeline linking the town of Kayapaye to the southeastern Chinese province of Yunnan. The 770 kilometer long pipe gives China a direct link to the Indian Ocean, allowing it to import oil and gas extracted in the Middle East and Africa without having to go through the pirate-prone and congested Strait of Malacca. And it's a boon for Myanmar too. The Shui gas field is Myanmar's biggest and sits just off the coast of Rakhine State and the vast majority of its output goes up the pipe to China. It's the largest extraction project in Myanmar ever. And it's not just oil and gas passing through the region. India too has its eye on Rakhine State, in particular Sitwe Port, which will soon form part of a key sea and land route for Indian goods. Linking the east of India to its landlocked northeastern states, it manages to avoid the Siliguri Corridor, also known as the Chicken's Neck. So it's attractive to both India, China and of course necessary for Myanmar. But whilst all this investment brings development to Rakhine State, it comes at a cost for the Rohingya. A stateless minority with no property rights, their homes have easily and brutally been wiped off the map. Well, let's go to Matthew again in Thailand. Matthew, how much of this persecution is down to economic interests? Well, it's certainly a factor. Uh, you know, it's worth mentioning also that the Rakhine Buddhist population has for many years been advocating for a greater share of the natural resources and natural resource wealth. And so there's a lot of animosity between mm. the Rakhine Buddhists and the, the, uh, the Burman uh, majority with regard to the resources. But certainly, you know, these are multi-billion dollar projects. Yeah. Uh, Rakhine State is the second poorest place, second poorest state in Myanmar, and it shouldn't be. Yeah. Let me go. Let me go back to Justin for a second. Uh, Justin, I want to talk about the Chinese. They seem to be ambivalent at the very best to what's going on uh, in Rakhine State. Uh, how are they as actors in, in this? China is really uh, is turning Myanmar into a, in, into a satellite state of, of China. The pipe, the pipes, the oil and gas pipes are incredibly important because the Chinese have always had a, a obsessive nervousness about the Straits of Malacca being being shut down. So they want to be able to, it's not just the oil and gas coming out of the ground in, in, in Myanmar, it's also oil from the Middle East, so they can, they're building a huge port as well, so that they are uh, insured against that, that 
uh, idea of, of the Straits being, being closed down. Well, there's also a uh, surge in tourism, strangely enough. I mean, this year we actually saw a, a, a big jump in tourism, despite what's going on elsewhere in the country. And, of course, you, you can imagine why they go. Look how beautiful it is. Um, but, Tunkin, it, it must be difficult for you to see, what, four and a half million tourists going to your country whilst all this is happening? Would you actually yes. support a boycott of international travel to Myanmar? Uh, for me, I think uh, boycotting uh, companies is much more important than others. Of course, this is also too, I mean, like uh, Pepsi and others, you know, who are investing there because uh, I think it is important that uh, much more sanctions and pressure need to be done to stop this genocide against Rohingya. Atunkin in The Hague, thank you very much. You get the last point there. Matthew Smith, thank you also for joining us uh, from Thailand. And uh, Justin Wintle, thank you for your expertise and insight on Aung San Suu Kyi. Well, thank you also for watching. You can catch uh, all our episodes on our YouTube channel. In the meantime, see you next week.